Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and this is, uh, this is day two of the homeschool conference <laughs> and our second keynote of the day in a row of three. Elliot, I'm getting a little bit of feedback from your mic, so if you don't mind, uh, go ahead and click that off for a second. I'll have you turn it back on. Thank you so much. Um, Elliot Washer is with us. Uh, really delighted to have him here. So excited for this event. We just had a terrific day yesterday and another fun long day today. We know that you can't go to all sessions. We know that um, you may be watching this as a recording. However you're taking it in, we're sure glad to have you participating. For those who are in the live studio audience, we will give you a chance now to indicate where you're listening from. To the left of the map are some icons. You're looking for the star icon, it's the second one down. You click on that and then click it again. Place your icon on the map. Looks like two so far in the continental US, one in Europe. Oh, Marie in Sweden, lovely. India, Croatia, Canada, well, good. Have fun. Please keep those, uh, keep telling us in the chat about where you are and your circumstances. Also interesting to know the educational circumstances in your countries. Well, it's really delightful to have you uh, talking again. You and I last spoke when we did a, an interview for futureofeducation.com on uh, your new book, which uh, generated a good conversation between uh, us, but also when I ended up writing a student bill of rights, um, led me to uh, sort of opening a Pandora's box with many others who have been sort of talking about the same things. Um, so appreciate your being here. And I'm going to turn the time over to you and let you move the slides forward. And then let me know how I can help. And I'm prepared with that YouTube video. OK. Uh, every, am I on now, Steve? You are on. OK. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. and. Uh, I got a little bit of a list of people. It's great to have you all here from all over. And uh, I'm going to do a little talk, and hopefully we get some questions generated uh, off of what I say. Um, I won't. I hopefully won't talk too long. And uh, and then I want, I'd love to hear from everybody out there. So um, I could think I can move to the first slide. Um, so that's. That's one of my dogs. Um, and for those of you who don't know uh, the things that uh, we've done at Big Picture, we have a, probably a couple of hundred schools around the world. Um, we're focused on starting with the interests and needs of each and every student and um, build work um, around that. And simply said, um, we've had lots of successes. Um, with our schools, with students and, and staff and community. And uh, uh, the book and the talk that I'm going to give is, is about uh, one of the things that uh, is very, very close to us, which is uh, student engagement, which is generated around uh, something that Seymour Saracen, who is one of our mentors, called productive learning. That students, in order for learning to occur, uh, students have to want to be engaged. 
And so I'm starting this slide off by uh, just a little story. That's one of my dogs. It's a Portuguese Pedango. Uh, that's uh, Katrina. And I have a lot of dogs. So I'm going to just do a little dog story um, for you. So uh, there's uh, two kind of duck hunters. And one of the hunters has a, a dog that walks on water. And he wants to impress his buddy. So they go into a duck blind and they shoot a few ducks and one of the ducks falls and the dog walks on water and retrieves the duck. And then his buddy doesn't say anything, the other hunter. So they do it again and sure enough the dog walks on water and retrieves the duck and still his uh, hunting buddy doesn't say anything and he's getting a little perturbed. And then finally the, the third time, uh, the dog does it again, and so finally the guy who has the dog, he says, uh, you notice anything different about my dog? And the hunter, his, his buddy says, yeah, uh, your dog can't swim. And what that tells us really is a lot of times in school um, we're measuring and looking at what students can't do, not what they can do. And our book and our story here about engagement is that students are already engaged in the world. Um, they're already engaged in, in learning and learning productively. It's that schools many times are not paying attention uh, to the expectations that students have of us. And we're mostly paying attention, unfortunately, to the expectations that we have of them. And Charlie and I wrote this book about many of these types of experiences where adults in and outside of school need to pay attention, as we say in the book from the line, Death of a Salesman, attention must be paid, uh, to the expectations of students that when they're at the at the final stages, these expectations are not just expectations, they're imperatives. So I'd like to uh, give a little bit of a talk today around that. Uh, to start us off, I'm going to show a little YouTube video that was done by our student Gianna and one of our advisors at our school, Rachel, um, around these expectations. So I think, Steve, if you could uh, play that now, that would be great. lately that schools have high expectations of students. Who's not for high expectations? But what about the expectations? Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. I'll wait to see if we can bring it back up. Uh, Steve? Say hello. We may have had a technical uh, glitch. Steve, you there? Say hello. Hmm. I'm not sure what happened. So. Uh, I'll wait for Steve for a second. We've got the start of it. Um, Elliot, ah, so, so Elliot, yeah. the movie was playing. Did it not play for you? Uh, no, it didn't. I heard the audio come through the speakers for a second. Okay, so uh, I paused the video. We can go back to it. It's about three minutes long. It looks like it was right. playing for everybody else. Ellen, okay. I'm going to go ahead and play it. If for some reason it doesn't show up on your screen, don't worry, we're seeing it, and we'll come back in three minutes. Okay, thank you. I hear a lot lately that schools have high expectations of students. Who's not for high
So if anybody had any trouble with that, I see that several of you were able to see it. I'll put the link in the chat one more time. Thanks, Elliot. Okay. Thanks, Steve. So um, I couldn't see uh, the animation. Like I said, that was done by one of our students, Gianna, and an advisor, Rachel, <laughs> around the world. And I'd just like to talk about that uh, and these points a little bit today. As you can see, uh, there's a honeycomb in front of you that has a, a number of these expectations that our students and our staff have identified and, and we wrote about. And, and so I'll spend a little time but talking about a, a few of them and what point of this is around student engagement once again is that that word is being and term is being used a lot lately. It seems as though it becomes the job of the teacher or the adult to engage students. And that's only part of the puzzle. The fact that students are already engaged in learning and that we're not taking it advantage of those pieces um, to connect and to get uh, students involved in going deeper around their learning and broader as they go deep, they go broad, is a big conundrum in our schools and a, a reason why students are disengaged and leave. So if we were to take a look at some of these, and, and I unfortunately don't have a, a student online uh, with me, I'm not uh, near any place where we have one of our schools to bring on, but if I asked them to talk, you would immediately hear from the projects that they're doing that many of these you know, points are uh, points of, of how they got engaged and when they got in, engaged in, in their learning. And I'll spend uh, just a little bit of time talking about a few of these pieces and some things from the book. So. So I do a lot of flying, and when I go on Southwest Airlines one time, uh, there was a flight attendant, and uh, he was on the mic, and he said, uh, Ken, uh, and this was at the beginning when they do their safety check, and they said, uh, excuse me, passengers, uh, can we uh, pretend to have your attention for just a moment? So when I'm on Southwest and they say something like that, I go, all right, uh, this makes a bit of sense. At least they know that I'm not engaged and care about what they're saying and not pretending that I do. And yet, when I go on United, the same thing happens. Somebody gets on, uh, usually the CEO of the United Airlines, Smiley, and he does a big push on marketing and says, we're about the customer. We're about the customer. We're about the customer. And when the flight attendant comes over to me and says, uh, uh, what would you like to drink? And I said, black coffee. And she says, how would you like it? And I go, I just told you I wanted it black. They're not paying attention to anything I say. So, in one situation on an airline, it's an interesting metaphor. They already realize that I'm not engaged. On the other situation, they're promoting engagement and don't pay attention to what I'm saying. And I think we have the same kind of issues in our schools many times. And this whole piece around how to engage students in authentic ways, in applied ways, where there's enough challenge, where they have enough time to practice, where they have enough time to play and make mistakes, where they have real choice in what, when, and how they want to learn, where they're connected to adults that they want to learn from of their choosing, that the time is right, and they have enough time. These are all real conditions for how students get engaged in school and the expectations that they have of us that quite frankly, many times uh, we're not delivering on. So here's a little uh, Bruegel painting. And 
fairly famous. Many of you know it. It's the fall of Icarus. And there's Icarus fallen into the sea. You know, Virgo, who many of us would consider to be a, a stoic in some ways, say, you know what? You better listen. You better listen to the adults in your life, or if you don't, you're going to fall into the drink. You're going to do something wrong. Well, that's one interpretation of of the fall of Icarus. But Bruegel was a little bit more cunning than that. And if you look at every one of the adults in the painting, as Icarus has fallen into the sea, nobody's paying attention. Everybody's looking the other way. And this is a big deal. I have a friend named Frank Wilson who's a neurologist. He wrote a, a very um, influential book called The Hand. Basically, in his book, he lays out that you can't have good tool use without good language, and you can't have good language without good tool use. And, and these are ways to engage students um, through their interests. And when Frank looked at this painting, he said, well, what if, what if Icarus was really just dreaming? And that the fall of Icarus was really a dream. And then when he woke up, it was really a different story. And the story really was that attention must be paid. That attention must be paid to the interests of students and how they get engaged in the world. And that adults in that world have to pay attention to what their interests are. So Frank's premise is very, very fascinating when it comes to the issue of student engagement from the vantage point of how students see themselves in the world, what their interests are, who they want to select as adults, and how they want to be engaged. So that's one of the premises of the book. Another premise of the book is uh, this fellow that most of us know, and uh, his, uh, his, his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head. And we argue, Charlie and I, in the book, that actually you can see the rise and fall of, of creativity through young people's engagement in the world by watching how Mr. Potato Head changed. So originally, when uh, Lerner, who developed this to Potato Head, started, he was fooling around in his garden after World War II, and he always made faces out of potato. Originally, the potato was a real potato, and you could put the pieces anywhere on that potato. And when he came out with his product, which was actually the first uh, commercial on television, for toys, uh, parents bought the pieces and put carrots and potatoes and their children put those pieces on them anywhere they wanted. Well, the problem was is that uh, these potatoes would end up at the bottom of a couch and rot away and there would be some kind of smell or odor and so he changed that potato to a piece of styrofoam. Still, you could put the pieces anywhere you wanted. And then what happened was they started making more plastic shells and more standardized pieces. So you couldn't put the pieces anywhere you wanted anymore. And the potato wasn't as real as it was. And then, as you could see in the early potato, uh, Mr. Potato had always had a pipe. And for kind of very good reason, C. Everett Coop, the Surgeon General, uh, made Mr. Potato Head the head of the no smoking campaign. He gave up his, he gave up his pipe. And then, after a while, Mr. Potato Head just went along his merry way, and you see him on the bottom left hand corner, and he's now all plastic, and the pieces can only go in certain places. And he had a big, uplift in a movie called Toy Story. Well, Toy Story told the story of Mr. Potato Head without the children telling the story of Mr. Potato Head. And now he's an avatar on Second Life 
where you can't even touch them. So, through the history of Mr. Potato Head, you can actually see how children have gotten less and less in some ways engaged in the real world, using the hands, telling narratives, and once again, adults paying attention. So here we have a professor who was the professor of both Zuckerberg and Bill Gates. And this is what he said. The thing I would say about Zuckerberg is that he was very eager to learn, very skeptical about whether anything we were teaching him was actually the right thing for him to be learning. I think Bill Gates had exactly the same feeling. It was not just respect for what he was being taught, but maybe not exactly what he was interested in, and so on. So he was, you know, absorbing everything and not paying attention to it at the same time. So here's two men who were interested in something else, dropped out of school, and the school and the professor actually knew that what he was doing in class and they were doing in class, was not what was on their mind. And although they could absorb it, it was not what they were thinking about. And you'd think that they could make that connection and keep these two fellows in school. And yet the choice was not to do that, which is a fascinating dilemma that we could all talk about because we have the same thing going on in our schools all the time around how do we engage students productively in learning? Do we keep on going on our way in the courses that are content-driven and standardized, or do we pay attention to the young people who are in front of us? So I'm going to stop there. I'd love to take some questions from people. Um, I'm not sure exactly how this is going to work, but I'd love to hear from you on some of the pieces that I laid out around engagement, creativity, expectations, that, that students have of us, not just that we have of them, and get your thoughts on that. Thanks, Elliot. I'd love to your, open it up. Your audio got uh, muted at one point. Did you move the microphone on your headset? Uh, no. Okay. But we can still hear you. It just got softer for some reason. Oh, um, okay. No. So if you have a question. If you have a question for Elliot, um, feel free to put it in the chat, or you can raise your hand. Uh, Cindy, who gave the previous keynote, uh, made a comment early on about uh, loving the expectations. Cindy, did you want to say anything? Early Saturday morning. <laughs> Anybody else ready to respond? So, Elliot, um, you and I had a long email conversation about the difference between the expectations and the Do you want to expand on kind of sort of how you would see that difference and why a student bill of rights was sort of less attractive to you than a set of expectations? Uh, uh, sure. I don't know if, if it was that it was uh, less attractive or that it was just different. Uh, so. Uh, our our piece was really around how to get students much more I like we've completely lost your audio now. It sounded oh, like you were moving something. Are you still there? Uh yep, I'm here. Okay, we lost you for a second. Does this help? Hello. Seems to. Can you hear you? Yeah. I 
Does this help? Oh, yeah, much louder. Yes, much louder. Okay. Okay, yeah. Well, I don't know if it was really about... Um, it was just a different different format. And, uh, and so... I can't, I'm trying to remember exactly what it what it was that was um, you know the point around the bill of uh, the student bill of rights um, and the expectations. We were it's it's uh, it's by me right now, Steve. I'm gonna have to get back to you on that question. I just don't remember to tell you the truth. Hey, another interesting uh, point that's come up, I think, a little bit yesterday was the measuring of outcomes. So, it, it big picture, you do a lot of encouraging the students to leave the school in order to learn. And then you work very hard to uh, help uh, colleges recognize the value of your students. I think a lot of people in, uh, have expressed that in alternative education or homeschooling or homeschooling, that there's this dilemma between measuring the way others measure um, and just kind of moving forward. How do you hold these discussions at Big Picture? So, so it's a, it's a good question. Um, what we do is we do um, not just because we're public schools. Um, we we pay attention, of course, to the to the content standards, but we also pay it attention to a, 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 a sets of other um, pieces that involve real world learning uh, that are um, that are authentic both to the students and to people in their communities and, and at work and those types of of real world standards if you will around mastery and around getting better at the things you want to get better at um, are many times a lot more engaging to students because it's it's real. They're connected to adults that they want to learn from, and they're connected to objects and the things in their community that they want to get better at. So if you put all those pieces together, you get high levels of literacy, high levels of language use, high levels of critical thinking, problem solving, uh, creativity, and and many times uh, significant collaboration that is not a setup like it might be sometimes in a project-based learning environment. When young people, when our students choose the people they wish to collaborate with rather than get assigned, it becomes more authentic to them in, in many, many instances. Um, and And those pieces play out Wow, all the time. So, so when you when you set standards around the workplace, how people work in that workplace, what the work actually is, when you when you have standards that students have of themselves around their own self assessments and their own social emotional growth. And the things that they want to persevere at that are, that they're intrinsically motivated around rather than extrinsic, just extrinsically around a grade and not knowing how or why sometimes they're learning what they're learning, uh, things change. So in our schools, those pieces will uh, play out in a very, very large ways and our students have a very, very different response to their learning. So two questions have come in in the chat. Uh, um, Marie, I'm wondering if I can hand the baton to you for a minute. Our next keynote has a question for me in setting up his room. So uh, Marie, can you take that? I don't know if you have a microphone. Lovely. I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Steve. Um, and so, yeah, we do have a couple of really good questions. Um, 
One is from Cindy here that was asking about whether we should be encouraging portfolios, not just of products, but process to get away from the high-stakes testing, and how would that look? Right. Do so, you have some thoughts on that, Elliot? Yeah, well, yes, I do. Um, at all of our schools, our students have, excuse me, portfolios. <clears throat> and we use a narrative assessment system, a portfolio assessment system, and, and their portfolios are connected to learning plans that their uh, families, somebody or somebody outside of school who plays a significant role in their life attends learning plan meetings where we set up the learning for a specified amount of time that involves students' interests and their needs and, and that moves them forward. So it's the portfolio system includes a learning plan uh, where students have voice, parents have voice, their mentors in the community um, from outside organizations and workplaces have voice in that process. And the collection of that measures growth over time, because we we work with our students over the four years of high school and that measurement of growth in a portfolio in their learning can be seen not just quarter by quarter or trimester by trimester or year by year, but over four years. And our students are part of that assessment in their own growth. And we believe very strongly that the most powerful form of assessment, or one of the most powerful, is self-assessment something that we do all the time. We hardly ever ask students how they think they did. What are the things they want to get better at? We mostly give them the feedback, but we also need their own feedback system that's very, very powerful, where as, as people, we're constantly self-assessing about what we're doing, making corrections, on an as-needed basis and as we go along. It's part of being a human being. That's a big deal. So in our portfolio system, there's a self-assessment component. There's a component from your mentors. There's a component for your parents. There's a component for other students. And of course, there's a component for your advisor, who's your teacher who knows you over four years and knows you're also your content area teachers. So that's a big, big deal. At the end of high school or nearing the end in their, in their last year of high school, our students put together a narrative around their growth and their learning, both academic, social, emotional, out in the real world. And so these, that autobiographical uh, sketch or narrative, if you will, is a very, very part of, uh, big part of their culminating activities. So it's not just a portfolio system. It's a portfolio system that has uh, specific structures in place uh, that, that, that give it some engagement and some teeth from mentors who students respect in the outside world who they want that kind of content be it academic or real-world know-how, knowledge from those people, and they get that type of feedback, which makes it even more engaging and significant. So it sounds like when you're talking about student growth, you're discussing something that is far, far richer than what most of the country is talking about, which has to do with test scores and percentiles. Do you... Uh, in, in addition to these authentic and real and meaningful kinds of assessment, do you all, do your students also look at the traditional test scores and so on, uh, perhaps as a, as a mechanism for getting into college and so forth? Well, yes, um, that does happen. But uh, once again, it's a little bit of an homage uh, to Seymour Saracen, who, who really got us thinking very deeply about productive learning where students want to be engaged, he would say, look, Elliot, uh, just because the baby's got a normal body temperature doesn't mean he's not sick. 
So we have eyes, we have ears, we have our senses, and we have young people in front of us. And testing is only one measure. And it's just in many, in many instances, a one-shot measure and a snapshot. It's not like it's not useful in some ways, but it's not the end-all, be-all. Uh, many times, uh, students perform real, real differently when they have objects that they can manipulate, when they can work with other people. And, and you're seeing way, way different types of results, really sometimes on the same material. So it's how they get engaged around the academic content, which we seem to think can only be measured without collaboration, without objects and manipulatives in front of you, and in a specified time. And at the same time, we talk out of the other side of our mouths and say, oh, we want a competency-based system where you can you you get measured anywhere, anytime, any place. And then we set up schools that have seat time requirements, lots of restrictions on students' movement, when they and where they can get credit. So if that doesn't sound confusing, I don't know what does. Somewhere along the line, going forward into the future, when we talk about performance-based and competency-based, we have to talk about release of seat time requirements, that when you learn something and you can show that you know it in a variety of different settings, not just on a test, but how it's applied out in the real world and multiple measures because not everybody needs to know all the different pieces of the academic content. You should be able to have bins and modules that um, and give you some kind of equality around the crediting and the things that you want to learn because as we teach four branches of mathematics, there's about 40 in the discipline of math. And so why do we keep focused on just those four rather than all those other pieces that may engage students in many, many more deep ways? So these are, these are large questions. Yes, the testing is a part of getting into a university or a college. We have a lot of success around getting students into the, into colleges or uh, in forms of post-secondary. Much of our success also is focused around students being able to articulate who they are, what their interests are, selecting the right place for themselves to go and pursue their post-secondary work. I'll give you an interesting example of some data that has just come out about us that was done by an independent third party. Uh, we followed our students out now a dozen years. What we found out is that by age 29, 100% of the students who graduated a two- or four-year school, out of that 100%, 70% had work in the work they were doing at our high schools in their what we call LTIs, their learning through interests or internships. Now, that's significant. Now, why did it happen? We're not exactly sure. My bet is that it happened because we built in social capital, which is a form of equity, where we allowed our students who normally might not have access to people who have similar interests and who they learn from and kept in touch with became their go-to people, their mentors, along with our advisors in our schools, that when they graduated school, they could go back to their community and actually get work that they're interested in. Whereas before, going to school, and even finding your interest, you're still disconnected from the people who are actually doing that work. So not only was it intrinsically motivating for students to have, do the work that they're interested in, 
actually develop and form relationships. That's who we are. We're taking advantage of a very, very old system and a way of being, and a way of being human, where we want to learn how to get better at the things we want to really do, and we want to be around people who can get us better at those things. And that's very, very deep engagement. And we don't talk about that much in our schools and schooling, of taking advantage of our students' interests, taking advantage of the people in the community who have mastery many times in those interests, and some are in their families, and some are people that they have a harder time connecting to from where they're coming from, but we make those things happen, so that's a big deal. That's awesome. Uh, we've got another question here from Bernard, who is asking, have you seen other schools outside of the big picture schools that seem to have promising models? And he's interested in getting your view on the benefit of having different types and models of schooling. Yeah, there's, I didn't hear the first. Can you repeat the first part of the question? Have you seen other schools outside of big picture schools uh, that you believe have promising models? Uh, yeah, a uh, few, um, and and there are many that I don't know about as well. Uh, there are schools that are just one-off schools. There are schools that are in uh, communities of practice together. Um, there's a, many good things happening out there. Uh, I would say. In terms of the benefits of having many models, that's fine. It's really important. The, the part that's interesting to me and where I think we as a collective group uh, need to have influence is that it's not about the model, it's about the practice. And that is really getting the messaging across about what student-centered really is, what the role of adults in a school that is really student-centered really is. Those are really significant pieces, as well as making the work Authentic. This goes back to those expectations once again. If schools are following through on the expectations that students have of us in significant ways, it doesn't matter what the model is. If models across are doing that type of work, that's great. When students' movements and ways of learning are so restrictive, that they become bored and disengaged, that's where the issues are. So I don't know if it's a question, and I'll throw it back to everybody, of models. It's a question of practice and getting our feet and mouth together in the same place. So words like personalization, words like authentic, words like terms like student-centered, well, everybody says my school's student-centered. Well, then it has no meaning. Every, everybody says our schools are personalized. Well, if you're delivering instruction and you think it's personalized because you're on a computer, that's not what we mean by personalized. Our, our students are having experiences that are personally engaging to them, both in and outside of school. That's much deeper than just talking and connected to people who they really want to learn from and who care about them, who are doing what's best for them. Those are big deals. So I'll keep on, I'll, for just to end it, I'll just repeat. I'm, I'm sure that there's a lot of great schools out there and a lot of models. And, and to me, that's fine as long as they're delivering on these types of expectations that students have of us, and that could be, and they could be uh, more added to them. And I think that that's part of the 
the bigger picture, if you will. Um, that's really brilliant, um, focusing on the expectations themselves, because clearly there are so many, many different ways that different uh, communities, different buildings, different uh, parent parental groups, different student groups are going to have different ways in which uh, delivering on those expectations uh, can work best for them. So that's um, that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful way from, for to help us to think about it. We have another great question here from Ashita, who's asking, do parents of students present with doubts or issues with regards to the methods used in their schools? If yes, how do you deal with it? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you have to deal with it. Like we have one student at a time in a community, one one family and parent at a time. Uh, the good news is, is that I believe what we're talking about here is very sensible and common sense. So how we learn outside of school is very close to what we're trying to bring into school. So parents really are familiar with it. They're familiar with, well, if I really want to know something, I might go on the Internet and Google it. Then I might read some books. And then the books aren't enough. I might want to talk to that person. Or I want to buy some materials, make it myself, figure it out. You know, there's a few ways that we really learn. We want to get in touch with the people who really know more than we do about it. We want to read more about it, which is encourages a living literacy approach to literacy. And, and we want to do and learn the skills, be they academic, social, emotional, collaborative, that, that people um, can, can give us. So when we talk to parents and families and we say, we're developing and designing a school where it isn't just the school and the place where your children are learning, but we're also giving credit for what you're doing with your children outside of school, and you may not think that that is, counts for school, but it does. If your child is singing in a choir, if your child is in a maker space, if your child is working with their parents on whatever it is that it involves a trade or a craft or a hobby, and there's all kinds of manipulatives, objects, language, richness, reading, literacy, mathematics, both applied and abstract, games, puzzles, we want to know about it. That counts as part of school. Those are places where where people are learning. It was really Larry Kremen who said, school shouldn't get all the credit for learning. They shouldn't get all the blame either when it doesn't occur. Parents and community are an integral part of the learning and where young people, children, you actually learn. So it seems like schools getting the credit because they're the ones who are saying, we're teaching reading. Well, yes and no. It's the students who are learning how to read, the children who are learning how to read, the parent or the grandma or the aunt or the uncle or the brother or the sister, whoever it is at home, where they may be learning how to read. And yet, it's the school or write or sing or dance or learning how to manipulate something, or getting really, really good at something. And yet we happen to think that the only time that credit is given for learning occurs, which I know this audience doesn't feel that way when I say the we, happens in school, in front of our noses, or else it doesn't count. That's pretty darn silly, and I think that parents understand that. So when we talk to parents in that way, about the kinds of structures that we put in place that become school, 
where you're involved, and we want to know and use you as a resource at a learning plan meeting so your child can be engaged fully in school, want to learn, want to go deep, and want to go broad as they go deep so they learn their academic skills, they develop social emotionally, they become good citizens, they learn to participate in the community, they learn about democracy. These are big deals. And parents can get those pieces. What they think of as school sometimes, which is rows and classes and somebody in front of you, which may have been their experience, well, there's pieces of that in schools for instruction when you want to be engaged, when you want to be engaged. Those are somewhat valid ways of learning as well. But the trick is, and the twist is, that piece that Seymour always talked about, does the child, does the young person want to be engaged? And then that becomes productive learning. So I think we do a pretty good job at moving parents towards that when they see a portfolio, when they go to their child's exhibition, no matter what age, and they're participating when they actually see learning occurring in and outside of school, these become big deals, and that's the education of the families around their child's learning, where now they're brought into an environment where they can see it, that they start to understand it. it it's a process. It doesn't, it's not overnight, but some parents, they just, you snap your fingers and go, yep, I got it. Others, it takes longer periods of time. You're right. Thank you so very much, Elliot, for uh, joining us today, for sharing such a deep and thoughtful philosophy and practice and perspective. Uh, it's been uh, just a, a wonderful, wonderful session. Um, I also want to thank all the participants for your great questions and involvement. Uh, I want to remind everyone as we finish up here, we are going to finish recording this uh, presentation. And please be sure to leave the room in order for that um, recording to process. So we're going to stop the recording now. And I want to thank everyone for coming. And again, thank you, Elliot. This has been really, really well, uh, interesting. Right. Well, thank you all. This, this is kind of new to me, trying to do this on <laughs> uh, a webinar. I usually have people in front of me, and it's a little bit harder to to figure out. So thanks for your patience and uh, appreciate your questions and your time. Well, you've done beautifully in this medium, so thank you. <laughs>